Well, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Okay, we won't need to. Okay, so I've just introduced Erica, and I'd like to um, open the floor to Erica. Oh, just sort of um, some just uh, housekeeping. If you have any questions, you can either put them in the chat or you can unmute yourselves. Erica is quite happy for you to take uh, for her to take questions as she goes along, um, and there might be a couple of minutes at the end um for other people to you know ask questions if you'd like to at the end okay thank you very much erica thank you thank you michelle it's such a delight to be with you and i thank you for your persistence i have to say after 16 months of teaching one to four times a day this is the only gematria based password that i have experienced um so um little little sort of um I mean, you've made it you've made it difficult, but I like a challenge. Um, it's lovely to be here and it's lovely to be back at Nair. Nair was uh, my shul at Davin's uh, uh, usually Friday nights at Nair. Uh, when Erica, I... you're... Mm -hmm. Hello? We're finding the, uh, the audio very difficult. Um, let me see. I'm gonna Michelle, it might be you because I can hear just fine. Just to let you know, it's just me. Or I'm finding the audio. I think it's you, Michelle, because you you've gone still, but everyone else seems moving and happy. Just to say. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's try to move beyond some of our technology and uh, talk a little bit about friendship in Miguel Root. I would like to devote our learning today, this evening, it's for me, it's the day, but for you the evening, to, um, to as a refua for those who are still recovering from the tragedy at Meron, um, and, uh, and certainly Lezecher, the Nishamot, uh, who died there, um, many of whom I think went to this event with friends. So what I wanna think about out loud with you is how friendship changes for people and we'll do that through the lens and perspective of Miguel at Root, of the Book of Ruth. But I wanna think specifically about friendship during the time of COVID. I think for many of us, uh, COVID narrowed our worlds very significantly. Some of us spent time uh, in total isolation or partial isolation for many, many months. And at that time, we may have reached out to friends, but the sort of social currency of eating with each other on Shabbat, of sort of checking in simply because we bump into each other in serendipitous ways in a supermarket or at the library, those things didn't happen at all. And as a result, some of the interactions, our interactions, our social interactions were significantly curbed. Some people reached out during this time. And in fact, many people have described and some research on this, that people reached back to childhood friends, people they went to uh, early, or in their early school days, or perhaps in their university days, there was a sort of need to connect with worlds that were formerly closed. But for other people, uh, finishing COVID, as hope we hope to do soon and get beyond it, is going to really sort of has unsettled friendships. And there's some people we resent who did not keep in touch. And there's some people we didn't keep in touch with. And so it's, it, it, one of the things that's very striking to me is the blessing, the bracha that we make when we don't see someone in 30 days and the Gemara Brachot discusses, and then for a full year. When I was studying the Talmud, I never thought to myself that there would be an entire year where I would go without the physical presence of a friend, but indeed that's happened. And I have to share with you one of the great delights of friendship for me has been that in the past few weeks, I traveled to New York to bring my daughter back to university after a second vaccination. And, um, and I saw five or six close friends and the beauty of making that blessing on each other, and really crying was very moving for me. At the same time, I understand that there are people who I may not be as close with, that social dining as we tend to do on, on Shabbatot and Chagim may not resume to its same levels, so that some relationships didn't sort of make the course. And so I want to, with your permission, turn to our shared screen. Um, if you could make me a co-host, I would be most grateful so that we can actually look at, uh, I'd like to look at a painting with you and I'd like to look at some texts, both biblical and other. 
Um, I'm currently disabled from screen sharing, but if you could help me share my screen, someone, shalom, hello. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that. that. Thank you so much. There we go. And there we go. All right. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, here we go. So um, I, I want to look at this. Uh, this is a contemporary artist. I invite you to Google uh, paintings of the Book of Ruth. I think there uh, there's some amazing uh, depictions, portrayals of Ruth in a very pastoral background. Um, I wanted to and and images of Naomi and Ruth in embrace. Uh, even woodcuts. Uh, there's an artist, a Ma a Margaret Adams Parker, who's done an incredible series of woodcuts on the Book of Ruth, and that sort of black and white starkness captures the starkness of all the loss that these women have suffered initially, and then takes us all the way to chapter four, where Ruth has a child, and where uh, the Naomi takes that child, and uh, and the group of women who named that child sort of done in this very uh, black and white sense of togetherness. So what we're looking at here is done by Sandy Freckleton Gagan, Whither Thou Goest. And what I love about this image is I think it also captures what Boaz says to Ruth later in chapter two, where he talks about how even though she has not perhaps been rewarded by other members of, uh, by the Israelites around her who continue to call her Ruth Hamoavia, she is, Boaz says, you have come to take refuge under the Kanfei Ashkina, right, under God's wing. And so I think there's this beautiful wing here that Ruth makes of this cloak in, um, in, protecting, in protecting her mother-in-law. And in, as you could see in the embrace of holding her mother up. Um, and uh, what I wanted to think about with you is, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start with a Shakespearean quote, a friend is one that knows you as you are, understands where you've been, accepts what you've become, and still gently allows you to grow. And so as, as some reflective questions to think about, and um, and I hope that we'll, Michelle, will, um, who, who's kindly organized this, will get the handouts to you so that if you if we don't cover all the material, you're welcome to uh, maybe maybe even study it around the table on Shavuot and and have a provocative and new conversation about friendship. What are the three most important qualities you look for a friend? What are the three qualities you bring to relationships of, as a friend? If you have lost a friend. And by lost, I don't mean the death of a friend, but a, but but a, a, a breakup. What was the reason for the breakup? Friendship breakups can be very very painful, particularly between old friends. Um, and and to talk about literally losing a friend, I was once teaching a group of seniors, and in um, in a Hebrew home here in the United States, and um, and we were talking about friendship. And a woman said to me, "I have." She was in her eighties. I don't have any remaining friends. And so here she was in her early 80s having to reconstitute a group of friends and start all over again. And, and my last reflective question is, how have your notions of friendship changed as you've gotten older? We don't have the same bandwidth for people who don't reciprocate. Um, it's hard to be friends with someone who continuously holds a grudge, someone who does not forgive. Perhaps we're holding grudges and perhaps we're not forgiving. And so let's think about these words of Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz um, uh, uh, from his book. Erica? Simply. Yes. Erica, sorry, I just wanted to let you know and everybody know that the uh, handout is in the chat. So if anybody wants to just click on it, it'll appear on their screen and then they can share screen or. Okay, yeah. thank you. Fantastic. Um, but I assume that all of you can see my screen. What is the essence of friendship? Rush Steinsaltz asked. It's the voluntary sharing with another things that are important for me, whether it's sharing my possessions or my persona, my time or my secrets. In fact, this sharing does not always mean giving, but rather it is the will to allow somebody else to participate in something that is dear to me. So I want to think about that before we approach Miguel Abrut. The, the capacity to share with something, someone something that is dear to me. I think one of the barriers to friendship is when one person is willing to make himself or herself vulnerable and that vulnerability is not reciprocated. So let's think about two 
friendship texts in Tanakh. The first we'll begin with is, is of course, is Ruth. And um, I, 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 I started studying Miguel Root very early on in my career as a teacher and uh, studying it and teaching it and looking at artwork on it and commentary on it. Um, and one of the striking things was when I started all those years ago, friend was not a verb, it was a noun. Only recently has friend become a sort of noun and you can count friends, right? I'm friending someone and you can have thousands of friends on an internet website and you've never met them. Um, so that's that's new and a different level of friendship. Let's look at let's look at uh, what Ruth says to Naomi. She says something, and we're very familiar with this. The setting, some, sometimes you'll see this on a wedding invitation, um, but it's not, it's a statement of platonic friendship. And she says, Now, this is very, very strong language. Um, the uh, the term lifgo an encounter is also the root of pigua a contemporary terrorist attack so you can see there's some strength in this and she feels that Naomi uh, when Ruth makes this very man magnanimous gesture I will go with you wherever you will go that Naomi is pushing them away so if you'd like feel free to drop in the chat your own thoughts about why Naomi does not want to take Ruth back with her and how Ruth has to work very, very hard. She has to persist. She has to be determined to make sure that she can stay with her mother-in-law. There's something unnatural about this relationship that Naomi recognizes that Ruth does not acknowledge. Um, and in fact, if you recall in the entire chapter, Naomi says to Orpah and Ruth in several different ways, you should find menucha, you should find rest, you should find a solace and consolation in the homes of your future husbands. She also tells them to go back to their mothers. In other words, and, and, and it's interesting to have some commentators say um, mothers, but not fathers. And I, I think it makes sense. Naomi's drawing a parallel. It's not natural to want to give up your life for your mother-in-law. If anything, give up your life for your mother, go back to your mothers. And so I think that on one level, Naomi understands that, uh, that maybe something is wrong in Ruth's own family relationships that, that make her not want to return, not want to return to her natural home. Um, Chava says, Naomi didn't want Ruth to come. Naomi wanted to protect her. She felt it would be worse for her. It was certainly might be more difficult for her to find companionship and love um, in, a, in an Israelite community when she is a Moabite. But let's talk about the cost for Naomi. So feel free to drop in the chat or to unmute yourselves what you think the cost is to Naomi in bringing Ruth back with her. She's an unwelcome Moabite. She's an unwelcome Moabite. She's a liability, Chava says. She's a reminder of all of the loss that Naomi has suffered. If you want to start your life afresh and anew, the last thing you want to do is take a human reminder back with you who also may make demands of you, right? Um, Gary says she may have been ashamed of or embarrassed by Ruth. And in fact, when they go back to Beit Lechem, um, please pay attention when we're reading this in Shul. Um, if you indeed can go to shul, but when she when she goes back, when Naomi goes back, and they and she says, "Don't call me, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara," right? Because you know God has embittered me. Um, they don't even ask. They say, "Hazot Naomi." No one actually even acknowledges Ruth's existence. She's absolutely invisible. No one says, oh, and who's that woman who's with you? Or, 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 or even notices her. I don't know if you've had this experience. Unfortunately, I have it. Uh, I've had it many, many times. Even when I'm a speaker in a synagogue, I will go into a shul and no one will say hello to me. And no one will say hello for the duration of a service. And I'll leave and if I get one Shabbat Shalom, it'll be a, a major victory. So there are times when 
you you can feel invisible and for for Ruth to make this huge commitment and not feel the reciprocal warmth of a community would be paralyzing and Naomi wants to prevent that but Naomi also has to protect herself and her future and in fact Naomi doesn't believe that Ruth could ever want to go back with her could ever want to form a friendship with her she she says to her I will I have, will I have husbands right for you and Orpah I, I I'm I'm too old even if I were to conduct a Levite marriage would you wait for them is there's no possibility that Naomi imagines that someone would want to befriend her and I imagine all of us have had more insecure moments where we wonder why anyone cares about us and why anyone would love us and Naomi because Naomi feels so punished by God so unworthy she can't imagine that anyone else would find worthiness in her um I just want to uh, uh, read some of the chats with you. Um, Lauren mentions the pain of what Naomi has lost. Julian, um, the further rejection from her own community. Um, hello, Julian. Um, uh, uh, um, she left during a famine. Linda points out another mouth to feed. There's another mouth to feed. There's someone else to be responsible for. If you don't know how you're going to get your own food, how are you going to provide provisions for someone else? Yvonne says she interferes with Naomi mourning alone. And thank you, Keith. Um, that makes me feel better that I'm not the only one to have experienced this. But the idea that now Naomi has this additional burden to take care of. So we understand why Naomi would perhaps forcibly, that, that strong word, lifgoa, that strong word would be used, that pushing away, that pushing back. And yet Naomi um, eventually resists. So let's have, um, let's have a look. At, and, and again, to study this, to do a sort of close reading with speed bumps, she says, Lashuv me'acharayach, to turn my back from you, which is what Orpah has just done. Orpah has just turned Lashuv me'acharayach. And that's the expected move. But to turn one's back on someone, right, is is what is the way that Ruth is framing this. Naomi doesn't see it as, as you're turning your back on me, you're betraying me. But that is the way that Ruth sees this. Ki el asher where you go, I'll go. Now that is an enormous burden if you're Naomi. To think, and, and um, uh, Aviva uh, Gottlieb, uh, Aviva Zornberg, Gottlieb Zornberg does a beautiful explication of this story and she looks at Ruth the idea of Ruth Davkaba that Ruth clings to her that clinginess is not always a positive quality what happens when someone sort of hangs on you they're so needy and when you have lost everything and you feel empty you don't have that love to give in fact I have to share with you that um, the last expression here which we'll get to momentarily but I'm going to read it now but Tere when she saw when she continued right when she was determined to go with her she withheld from speaking to her in other words this is not someone who says you know if i if i were if we, we didn't know this text we didn't recognize it and i said imagine for a moment that someone says i will do anything for you your people, my people, your God, my God, you're buried. That's where I'm going to be buried. And you expect someone to say, I love you too, right? Or maybe there's a hug back, or maybe there's some, some little crumb of affection. And here there's nothing. He she, she doesn't say anything negative to push her away, meaning she's not accepting this fully. She's just not turning Ruth away. She understands Ruth's desperation in this moment and Ruth's need for Naomi and for a redemptive and new future that perhaps Ruth associates with Naomi and Naomi's religion, Naomi's people, Naomi's God. I never understood this. This was very hard for me to understand. So I'm gonna share with you an insight. My grandparents uh, are Auschwitz survivors. My mother is a child survivor. Miraculously, they were all separated and found each other within a year. My grandparents were each liberated, one by the British, thank you very much, one by the Americans, within a day apart, but it took them a year to find each other. Uh, my mother was, was taken to an orphanage in Lublin. 
And my grandfather was taken by the Haganah on his way to Israel. And he was actually in Italy at a DP camp when he heard that an orphanage let out in Lublin. And he took the risk of going back to find her. He happened to find her. They had been separated for a long time. She certainly didn't look the same physically, but she has a very distinctive birthmark on her leg. It's an, it's an amazing miracle story. I noticed something really interesting about my grandparents. They only had friends who... Uh, had who, who uh, almost all of their close friends had been through the war together. It was almost as if when you've had so much loss, it's very, very hard for people to understand who you are, your emotional makeup, your concerns, um, your, your suspicions, your difficulties, your challenges, unless someone has been through that experience with you. And yet being with those people often took them to a place they didn't want to go. So my grandparents had, and I don't know if this is true for anybody, if, if it's true for you, you can unmute, you can drop it in the chat room. My grandparents had um, certain silverware and cutlery and even schnapps that they would only save for friends and no one ever used any of those things. Um, it was a very haunting reality. And it took me a long time. And, and what did it was this, one of my grandparents' friends died. And I said, Booby, you going to the funeral? And she said, no, 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 it's too far, it's too far. I said, but Booby, you've been friends with them for 50 years and, and, and they only live a, a state away. It was only a few hours drive. And I, I think there's something about the experience of this kind of pervasive deep loss where for Naomi, she senses that God has punished her because how could she lose so much if God loved her, if God cared for her? And that's the way that she has framed this experience. And and what what Naomi does, which it is uh, what 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 Ruth does, we'll talk about in terms of sort of restoring some of that faith to her. But Naomi is at such a loss that that she doesn't want anyone who reminds her of that loss. And yet, will anyone in the future, when she goes back to Beit Lechem, will anybody be able to understand her who has not been through this same experience? Now, what's interesting is um, when she says, Basher tamuti amut, um, from, uh, you know, where you die, I will die. And she doesn't say where you live, I will live. Maybe that's a given. Or maybe because these two women have suffered so much death that there's a sense that at least Naomi will not die alone. She will have Ruth. Now, what's remarkable about this story, and I've often said that this should be called the book of Naomi rather than the book of Ruth, because Ruth is, as we'd say in literature, a, a static character. She's always good. And Naomi is a dynamic character. She's a character who changes and evolves. We always expect Ruth to be generous. We don't know about Naomi. Naomi, it will take Naomi time. And even though Naomi tries to convince us that she's going to do nothing for Ruth and Ruth's future, it is Naomi who sort of brokers the relationship on the threshing floor in, in, in three that leads to, to Ruth's eventual marriage to Boaz. Ruth, in order for this story to make sense, to have the happy ending that Naomi so richly deserves, Naomi will have to rebuild the inverted pyramid that has been created by loss of country, loss of spouse, loss of children, right? Loss of community. And we know that these are Moabite women and, um, and Talmudic reading has them not having children. There are no children mentioned. So this infertility, I mean, everything in Naomi's world is narrowing and shrinking. And so in order to rebuild her life, we'll have to take the top of that pyramid and build it up, build it back slowly. And the last relationship, which will be so critical for Naomi, is the relationship she has with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's not enough that she will have Ruth as a dear friend and companion. It's not enough that Ruth will be married and Naomi's financial future will be secure. It's not enough that there is an Oved, a lovely grandchild, but there's one other piece that has to come back to Naomi for her life to be whole. And that is her relationship with God. She needs, and when the women around her say to her in chapter four, that Ruth has been better to her than so many sons and that Ruth has been a Meshiv Nefesh, she has restored her. That's really in many ways, the highest level I think of friendship is to be able to restore someone to their former happiness to restore someone to their spiritual wholeness. I'm gonna stop the share for a moment. If anyone wants to make comments, observations, thoughts.
Okay, I'm going to go back to our screen. And what I'd like to do, share with you, I think there's someone to, that needs to be muted. Now, if we look at the relationship of Jonathan and David, we notice something very similar. And I'm not going to go into this in great depth, but one of the things that we notice, right? If you remember, Yonatan is the son of King Saul, of Shaul. Yonatan is David's best friend. Um, Yonatan uh, beseeches David to uh, make a covenant with him and a sort of death do us part um, situation. And one, one of the things that we notice is that is that it's Yonatan, as, as with Ruth, who invests more in the relationship, who articulates more of the emotion, which raises a question. Do all relationships have to be even, right? Do, do, do we have to reciprocate in an equal manner in order to continue having meaningful, meaningful friendships? So I wanted to look at Rabbi Steinsaltz again on this, and we're looking at the top here of page four. Although the exchanges in friendship are not measured, uh, friendship is mutual. Friends have to maintain a sense of equity. A parasite is not a friend. One party may be stronger or the friends may rely on each other for different things, but there must be mutuality in the relationship. Friends have to be able to lean on each other. And at the beginning of the story of Ruth, that is not the case. Ruth leans on Naomi, um, or, or I would should say, Ruth sets up a situation where Naomi can lean on her, but the reverse is not the case. Of course, we have statements um, throughout our rabbinic literature, throughout Tanakh and rabbinic literature, about the importance of friendship. We have the Gemar in Tanit, Oy Chavruta, Oy Mituta, either friendship or death. We have the idea, the utilitarianism of friendship, two are better than one. They have better, more reward for their labor. They can get more done. If one falls, the other can pick up his fellow. Woe to him that is alone when he falls, for he has not another to help him. And I love the way that Kohelet um, teases this out of why two are better than one. And, and on one level, it's simply, we can get things done faster, we can get them done better. But there's also something that's deeper here. And that's the idea of lifting someone up. You, we all need someone to lift us up when we fall. Um, a lovely Gemara and Brachot, of not parting from a friend without exchanging words of halakha. And the idea is that when you think of that friend, you will always think of the learning and the teaching that you did um, that you did um, in, 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 in that person's honor. So that, that person will always come back to you with some, with some learning. And of course, the famous statement in Tanit, I've learned much from my teachers, but my, from my friends, I've learned more than my teachers. So I wanna do something um, quickly with you. And I want to, um, in order to go back to Ruth, I want to take a little break and um, take us to a slightly different period of time. I want to look at Cicero. Cicero had a lot to say about friendship. And um, certainly Aristotle did. And we'll, what we're going to see is a Maimonides version of Aristotle's thinking. But first, Cicero. Now, the support and stay of that unswerving constancy, which we look for in friendship, is loyalty. Nothing is constant that is disloyal. Moreover, the right course to choose for a friend is one who's frank, sociable, and sympathetic. That is one who's likely to be influenced by the same motives as yourself, since all these qualities conduce to loyalty. It's impossible for a man to be loyal whose nature is full of twists and twinings. You can't, you, one is untouched by the same influences as yourself and is naturally unsympathetic, cannot be either loyal or steadfast. And I'll just go to the end. Friendship cannot exist except among good men. And he probably meant men. So I want to just think with you about what 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 um, Cicero is saying. Cicero's notion of friendship is that you need to be friends with people who are like you, maybe exactly like you, because then you can be social and sympathetic. You can be frank. Um, you can be loyal. In Cicero's modality, friendship is based on mutuality, on um, shared interests, shared background, um, shared, uh, perhaps shared narratives. That is Cicero's idea. And so I asked you, what do you think Cicero looked for in friends, right? And what is, what do you think friendship cannot exist among good men means? In other words, it, according to him, if two people are good men, then there's a capacity, they're filled with virtue, there's a capacity for them 
to be friends. So I want to contrast this with Maimonides' readings um, from the from his um, parish, parish Mishnayo, his explanation of the Mishnah. Uh, right, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Maimonides finished this. Um, he finished his commentary on the Mishnah at the um, ripe old age of 23. It's quite astounding, not only because of Maimonides' general prolific nature, but also the deep wisdom we find in the way in which he we, which he treats this. So we know this statement, um, make a rav for yourself, acquire a friend. No one wants to pay for friends, right? Kinyan is the language of acquisition. And we don't generally say, I'll create a rav. Now, some people want to make their own rabbi, psak.com, they're always looking for their own solutions. But that's not what this says, right? And so that's that's the basis. And Maimonides will be interested. We're just going to do the English in the interest of time. Uh, but you're welcome to to look at the Hebrew uh, and study it on your own. Make for yourself a teacher. So Ra- Maimonides says, what does it mean, a selcha rav? You have a rav. You don't make a rav. Um, and uh, and and here he says that is to say. Even if he's not suited to be your teacher, put him in the position of being your teacher until it seems to you that he's indeed teaching. You'll acquire wisdom for learning from another is of different quality from learning on one's own. Learning on one's own is good, but learning for another endures longer and is more clearly understood. This holds true if he's your equal or even your inferior in wisdom. What does that mean? We learn from everyone. So I'd love for you to drop in the chat if you're up for this. I know it seems like only a few of you are up for this. So I'm inviting you not to check your emails and just be, woo, he named me fully present. What what have you learned from a friend? Um, I can say I've learned so many things from friends about the art of living um, in large part because many of my friends are 10 years older than I am. And they've gone through experiences with their own children and with life and at work. In fact, I, I'll, I'll say this not only as a, you know, as, as a woman, I, I think this is true as a person, but it was particularly important for me to speak to working moms when I was a young mother, to figure out how to achieve some sense of balance if, if that's even possible. There's so many things that I've learned because I made people, my friends, into teachers. They, and that's not because they had a formal teaching degree. Um, that's simply because they were willing to share their wisdom with me. Um, Michelle says, how to be a friend. Linda, um, the art of listening. Julian has lost track of everything he's learned, um, how to be a friend. Um, the acceptance of difference, and that's the whole family white. Constancy and continuity and acceptance, patience. Um, you know, what they can do, what what I can't do, even just basic skill sets, right? Things, someone says, I'll teach you how, I'll teach you how to make challah, or I'll teach you how to, you know, how to do this basic thing. Those things are really important. What about this idea of acquiring a friend? None of us wants to rent a friend. We don't want to acquire friends. We don't have to buy friends. We, we want to have friends. Um, and, and so Maimonides is going to take us through Aristotle, his version of, Ar- of the way that Aristotle understands this in his Nicomachean Ethics. And, um, and I, I, but I want to read his, his preamble. He says, note the language of acquisition. It doesn't say make for yourself a friend or become friendly with others. The point is a person must acquire someone who will love him or will correct his deeds in all of his matters. As the saying goes, either friendship or death. And if he does not find a friend, he must persevere with all his heart, even to the point of seducing the other person to love him until he wins his love. He shouldn't cease from bowing to his will until his love is strong. Sorry, there's a little bit of ambient noise that I cannot control. As the teachers have said, when you love, do not love on your own terms, but rather on the terms of your beloved. And when both friends act according to this principle, each will seek to fill the words, fulfill the will of the other, and they share a single intention. How fitting are Aristotle's words in this regard a friend is a second self. Now, a friend is a second self, not because in Cicero's definition, a friend is like you, but a friend is very much not like you. And you have taught yourself to love on that friend's terms, not to love on your own terms. I don't know about you. I'm going to stop the share for a minute. I don't know about you, but I do have friends who, when I call them, it's the suffering Olympics. And I'm going to give you an example. I go to the dentist, I call a friend, I say, oh, I just had a cavity filled. And the person says, that's nothing, I have a root canal. 
or because someone mentioned the art of listening, um, what happens even it, it, not the suffering Olympics, but the joyful Olympics, right? Um, sometimes someone wants to tell us something great that happened in their life and we don't really give them the space or the proper attention. Or maybe, maybe someone says, oh, my child, my son just got engaged. And we say, Mazal Tov, when's the wedding? And we're always moving to the next, to the next step. We sort of don't allow ourselves to stay in that moment and love on the other person's terms, which means to listen on the other person's terms, to not interrupt. So I just wanna um, share a little piece of research. Um, I teach at George Washington University, but down the road, road is, um, is, uh, uh, is Georgetown University. And in Georgetown University, there's a, a linguist, a professor of uh, linguistics. Her name is Deborah Tannen. She's written many best-selling books about a conversation. She studies conversations. Um, and she wrote a paper called New York Conversational Style. And a subset of the people she studied in New York were Jews. And this is the way she describes Jews talk. High involvement, concentric overlapping. Someone type that in the chat because you're going to say, oh, I wish I remembered. What did Erica Brown say? What was that thing about the way Jews talk? High involvement, concentric overlapping. I'm really, really excited. I'm very passionate about what you're saying. So I don't actually let you finish. Now, we tend to think of that as a way that we connect with another person. But actually, in some ways, it feels it feels disrespectful. Thank, thank you, Julian. Um, in some ways, it feels disrespectful. We don't allow that person to finish sentences to sort of and, and then give them a further question and deepen their experience of joy or of suffering by by just with our with the, the grace of our quiet. Um, so that can be sometimes a little bit a little bit difficulty, uh, a little bit difficult. Um, uh, just uh, uh, Jennifer just pointed any relationship, including friendship, involves time and investment, and you have to give in order to receive warmth and companionship in return. Beautifully said. All right, we're going to go back to our screen share, and we're going to talk about three types of friends. All right, and I want you to think about relationships as we're doing this. First of all, I want you to think about Miguel Ruth and where Ruth and Naomi's friendship, where, where, where we put them in these three categories, but also different relationships that you have that fulfill one of these categories. The first is a useful friend. The second is a pleasant friend. And the third is a friend who ethically inspires and instructs. So let's go on. The useful friends are like two partners. Theirs is like a friendship between a king and his army, right? A king needs the army. The army needs to be led by the king. And this is an absolute, this is, this is utilitarianism and it's not judged. It's not judged as a lower case of friendship because we need people like that in our lives. When I used to drive carpool, my, when I still had kids at home attending school, when I used to drive carpool, I looked at everybody with one set of eyes. Do you have a Honda Odyssey eight seater? I was absolutely utilitarian about it. If you had seven seats, I'm sorry, I'm not interested in you. You're not a good driver, shalom. It was, I had carpool eyes. And the fact is, the people who drove carpool with me, some of them went on to become closer friends, but many of them didn't. I have friends who we share shopping and we share errands. They're not the closest people, but I can count on them. And I, and I, and I think it's very, very hard to raise a family um, without friends like this. Um, uh, thank God we live in, um, in, in from Jewish communities where there's a grammar of a, a currency of chesed. And if God forbid someone gets sick or there's a shiva, everybody's there. People who, I mean, you know, people have shared with me that, that their shivas were sometimes most meaningful when people who were strangers or simple acquaintances really invested the time and made the time to come. That's what it means to be in a relationship. That's what it means to have friends who are useful in your life. And so I don't want to minimize that. In fact, we actually have a lot of psychological research on what's called today weak ties weak ties. So if you want, you can Google that weak ties. Weak ties are the people that are in our lives, right? The people who dry clean our clothes, the green grocer, um, you know, someone maybe in, a, in the gym, we say hello to them, they're in an exercise class, we exchange books. Life needs weak ties. In fact, one of the real difficulties of COVID was that we kept in touch perhaps with our close friends, but all those weak ties we lost contact with. We don't even know what happened to any of those people. So for Maimonides, the first level of friendship is that weak ties, the useful friend. 
and they're two kinds of pleasant friends. So now we're going to subcategorize the, um, the delightful friend uh, or the pleasant friend, the delightful friend and the trusted friend. The love of men for women is characteristic, he writes, of the relationship with the delightful friend. A trusted friend inspires full confidence so you feel it unnecessary to be reserved with him in action or in speech. You'll be able to reveal to him all your concerns, the good and the ugly, without fear that you'll be hurt either by him or anyone else. When one achieves this level of confidence in another person, he will discover deep pleasure in speaking with him and loving him. So I want to think with you about delightful friends. The first category, all right, in pleasant, of pleasant friends. The delightful friend is someone you see who makes you happy, who brings you joy. You don't have to have a deep relationship with that person. Oh, that one tells a good joke. I love going out for a meal. Sometimes other people go, oh, one day we'll do lunch and you never do lunch. But in your mind, you would like to do lunch with that person because there's just a level of delightfulness. And um, Baruch Hashem, I have a lot of delightful friends and, and I'm just so happy to see them. But I often, but I, I, I've seen very few of my friends, um, you know, during COVID just now emerging, uh, emerging from that. And then there's the trusted friend. Now, for many people, the trusted friend is the highest level of friendship. If you can, as the Rambam says, if you can share all the ugliness, all the difficulty with that friend, and that person doesn't judge you, and that person still loves you, and that person takes pleasure, it's so deeply pleasurable to talk to someone who does not betray a confidence, where you can be fully vulnerable without worry about any ramification or negative consequence. And for the Rambam, that is true pleasure. And I think there is pleasure. I think, I think the Rambam helped me appreciate the fact that I could take delight in some people and that trust is an aspect of pleasure because there's so few people we really can trust and it's deeply pleasurable. And sometimes we don't take note of that. We don't thank people and say, thank you so much for being someone I can trust. For, for putting your trust in me. It's a lot of responsibility to have someone else's trust. And I think about that when we're at the point where we might break a confidence, what does that say about us? What does that say about the disruption of pleasure? But now let's look at the Rambam's last level of friendship. When, and, and, I, and, and, and I have some quotes and we'll, we'll look at them in a second, uh, some questions for you. When both friends yearn for and are directed towards one goal, namely the good, they are to each other ethically inspiring friends. Each one will want to be helped by his friends in achieving that good for both of them together. And this is the kind of friend that we're commanded to acquire. This kind of friendship is similar to the friendship that a teacher feels for a student and a student feels for a teacher. Now, what is the Rambam? It took the Rambam all of these words, all of these words to say just this. The Rambam is saying, you want to know what it means to acquire a friend? There's one kind of friend you have to acquire. That's the kind of friend who's ethically a little bit out of your league. That's why the Rambam says you have to persist, right? Remember early in his introduction, you have to persist. You have to seduce that person. You have to make time for that person. You have to invest in that person. That's what you have to do to acquire someone who's a little bit out of your league, spiritually, ethically, maybe emotionally, but you know that you will be a better person as a result of that friendship. And that's the kind of friendship that you need to pursue. The other friendship, the useful friends, the confidential friends, the trustworthy, delightful, pleasurable friends, you can have those. But that's not what, that's not what the Mishnah in Avot is speaking about. What the Mishnah in Avot is speaking about, according to the Rambam, is the highest level of friendship, is that I am a better person as a result of being friends with you. We can all think of people who make us worse. You sit next to that person in shul, always a little gossip. You know what Mishlei says? That uh, the gossip is like a delightful morsel, right? You swallow it and then it gives you indigestion, right? And, and, and we're drawn to that, right? And you know, there's the friend who says, you know, did you watch this show on Netflix? And there's the friend who says, do you wanna come with me to a shear, right? There are people who help us be better versions of ourselves, be more deeply inspired because they inspire us. And the Rambam says, you know, sometimes those friends aren't in your circle. So you've got to go out of your way to acquire them. And that's really what I think we have in the story of Ruth and Naomi, is that Ruth saw in Naomi, we don't know what she saw because she never tells us, but she saw enough of someone 
who represented something to her, some goodness, some sense of, of family, of rootedness, of community, of love for Israel. Ruth saw that and said, I want that. I need to acquire that. And on some level, Ruth does the same for Naomi, right? Ruth helps restore Naomi to a sense of her own virtue, to her relationship with God, to her relationship with self, to her relationship with community. When she comes through those gates, she says, call me Mara, I am bitter. Imagine wearing a sign that said, I am bitter. We've all been through something where maybe we wore that sign for a little while. But Ruth taught Naomi slowly, slowly how to take that bitterness and put it away and replace that bitterness with a sense of optimism and hope in the future. I actually, I love the book of Ruth. Um, I know as a teacher, you're not supposed to pick favorites, um, but it's certainly one of my favorites. So much is accomplished in only four chapters. It's a little bit harder in life. It's harder to let go of grudges it's harder to be deeply forgiving. It's harder to reach out when we're in pain. And yet, I think that's the way Ruth challenges us. So I'm gonna leave you with a charge. It's what I call life homework, take it or leave it. Perhaps there's someone during COVID, a useful friend, a delightful friend, an ethically inspiring friend who you lost touch with. And that person may be suffering as a result of the fact that you've been apart, that you've been distant. What would it look like to say in celebration of Shavuot, of Kabbalah Ta Torah, as I celebrate what it means to be at Sinai again, I also celebrate the Book of Ruth by, by articulating what I love about my friends, by reaching out to people who are in need, by seeking out an ethically inspiring friend, by telling a friend that I care about just what it is in he or she that has made that has created such deep affection we don't always do that we assume our friends know but i think one of the things that COVID has shown us is the cost of distance and maybe people do need to hear how loved they are by us and maybe although naomi did not have the space to hear that in the beginning of the story she had the capacity by the story's end thank you so much questions observations Wow, thank you so much, Erica. Um, if anybody wants to unmute themselves or put some more, there's, there's, um, there's quite a long point there by um, David yes. in the chat. Um, but if anybody else wants to um, ask anything, please unmute yourselves now. Um, David, I, I really appreciate your comment. And it's an interesting question, can friends be family, you know, can family be friends? I certainly hope so. Um, I certainly hope we think that way. I think sometimes we treat so you friends can better than friends, family. But not your family. It's a famous, what? There's a famous saying, isn't there, that you can choose your friends, but not your family. Yeah. <laughs> you can be both. Obviously, you can be both. Yeah, and I and I've heard people say that um, that you know friends are the family that I've chosen, and I think there's a lot of merit to that, and I certainly uh, experience that. But I think that there are times when we're kinder to our friends than we are to our family, and um, and sometimes we we don't articulate to our family things that we might articulate to friends. I think there's someone talking in the background, so I don't know if you can um, if someone can mute. Um, yeah. yeah. Any anyone. Any other questions? Um, may I make a comment? I just, uh, hello. Um, well, I was just thinking about the sadness and the loss at the beginning of the story, um, which is, it, it, uh, and you mentioned uh, the Cicero and he meant men. And I was just thinking about the kind of um, female nature of the story, that it's yeah. a story of the friendship of women, but. It, it seems that the, the, the loss at the beginning is through um, really unkindness and, and, and lack of the ability to share with other, you know, uh, Eli Melech not wanting to give food in Beit Lechem and so on. Mm -hmm. But there's a real, there's an enormous actually restoration through friendship itself. I mean, there are some kind deeds, but mostly it's just about the, the relationship themselves. And I'm just thinking, about how uh, 
that's enough to be incredibly restorative. So yeah, even and, and in such a short time, I think, you know, I, I think some of us feel when we're with an old friend, you know, it doesn't take long, we might not have seen that person for a long time. And just suddenly things, things just go back. And we're aware of just how meaningful that relationship is. Um, but I do worry about uh, about COVID because I think it created um, it created a, a geographic distance that couldn't be bridged, but it also created psychic distances that couldn't be bridged. I think some people were struggling with childcare, some people were struggling with illness, mental health issues, and illness, and they didn't have the bandwidth to email and they didn't have the bandwidth to call. And now they've got to deal with people who are angry at them for not for not keeping in touch. So I I, I do think there's a lot of work that has to be done on the restorative level, and maybe we can take some kind of comfort that that Ruth was able to accomplish that in only four chapters, you know, surely we can reach out and and sort of do our best to sort of reconnect. Um, I know that it's it's not always easy to articulate to someone you care about. This is why I love you. Um, but if we're not going to have those conversations now, honestly, when are we going to have them? It's time to have them. Erica, that was beautiful. You can see from the comments and the messages in the chat you know how much your words have meant to us you have really um i don't know you, you've really brought in a way us into the gillard root somehow our feelings our thoughts you've brought those thoughts out of the megillah and us into the megillah and you've also brought such contemporary ideas um you know things that we feel that that we've been feeling especially in the last year but also throughout our lives You've just really made, I think all of us are now thinking, yes, I need to connect with this one. I need to connect with that one. So that's really practical. That's, I mean, I find that about your books. I'm just going to show some of them here. This one's um, about the three weeks. Um, this one's uh, about Yona. Okay, this is the Magid series and my newly acquired, I'm very proud of, Esther. Okay, so these are just some of the books. They are wonderful. and. They are exactly what you've done this evening. Very practical, but very, it's close reading of a text that brings out these ideas and that makes it resonate so much with us. So thank, thank you. you so much. Well, also, thank if you. I, just a last word. Don't yeah. wait. Don't wait. You know, we learned something from Avraham. Don't wait when it comes to chesed, right? And it was like, when it comes to doing something good, rush to do it. I think the impetus is always there when you finish a shear. The question is, what happens tomorrow? So I have still a few more hours in the day than you do. <laughs> but uh, I div I'm going to take, uh, take the Rambam's words to heart just as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And for everybody who's been asking me, um, I'm going to try and put the handout. The handout is in the chat. Um, some people haven't been able to access it. We're going to put it on the website. If there's any problem, then you can either contact me or contact Louise and we will send it to you. Okay, so I'm michellesint at gmail.com. Anybody can just email and just ask. Erica, again, thank you very much. Thank you thank for you. inspiring thank us you. all. Thank you. Chag Sameach, everyone. Bye. Chag Sameach. Thank you, Hatsumaya.